excited to announce this next group of speakers uh, and uh, and really get uh, their feedback and input. But I'm honored, really, to be uh, announcing these speakers in honor of Women's History Month. We've put together this panel of women leaders in tech to explore how virtual worlds can really evolve the workplace and what this means gender, diversity, and equity. So please join me in welcoming Courtney Chakran of EXP World Holdings, CMO of EXP, Mitra Bass, the PwC uh, partner, head of women of PwC, Lilac Alon of AT&T, AVP of Partnerships and Ecosystems, and moderating for us a really good friend of Verbella, Sarah Seacrest, founder of Cosmos, and really one of our early community builders for Verbella, a real true expert on building immersive spaces with us. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sarah. Thanks so much, Kat. I agree, really honored to be here with all of these amazing women leaders um, from at t EXP, Field Buildings, and PwC. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourself a little bit more and also share a moment when being in Verbella felt normal and authentic for you. An awkward moment to welcome. This is a safe virtual space, of course. So, Courtney, uh, how about we start? Great. Right. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. So awesome to see everybody out in the audience today, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Appreciate everyone. Um, so yeah, just you know, a little bit about myself. I've got about 25 years um, in marketing, predominantly most of my experiences in consumer finance, housing, and, and technology. And and my story is um, two years ago, almost to the date, um, I was interviewing to for the role I'm in now, which is the CMO of EXP World Holdings, which is the holding company, the parent company for Verbella and Success and EXP Realty. And um, I was meeting with the founder Glenn and some of the other, um, you know, our CFO Jeff. Whiteside and, and, and Randy, who's on our board, and, and really trying to get to know people. And, and my story is that I started the application process and interviewing and getting to know people. And it was a couple months. I did it all from the moment I met Glenn to the point where I actually signed an offer in world as an avatar. So imagine, um, you know, two years ago, if he'd said, you know, two years later, we'd be where we are now celebrating our 10th anniversary. It's just, it's really phenomenal. And, you know, one thing, I can say is it's become a moment for me that's quite sentimental when I'm in world I have I have all the feels if that makes sense um especially as I'm getting to see people and watch them walk through the steps I took before two years ago so happy to be here thank you Courtney that's amazing to go through that whole process uh, virtually uh, Lila would you like to go next Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me. This is really exciting to have, I want to say, the, my first virtual speaking uh, event. Uh, I'm Lila Kilan. I'm with at and I'm the Assistant Vice President for Ecosystem and Innovation, which the team and I uh, really are charterists to uh, work with a platform provider like Verbell and bring to market uh, new use cases and new adventures and new experience powered by the power of 5G. So we work together with companies um, like Rubella and the others uh, and bring them to market. And, and talking about the, the, you know, when is the virtual world become so true and, and authentic to me, was actually in our first interaction, uh, Jim Lassinger, I hope he's in the crowd today. Um, he's a responsible in fostering the relationship with Rubella. Like, right, like let's, let's get together and meet in Verbella. And as we were exploring the different meeting rooms and the different functionalities, um, we were touring around. And sure enough, as I learned how to sit, and I still have not figured all of those steps out, but as I, as I figured how to sit and how to walk, my avatar kind of like overlapped with his avatar. And I immediately, kind of my knee-jerk reaction was like, step away, take my avatar to the other side of the room. Now, kind of like we were we were talking, we didn't even notice it, but in hindsight, it made me kind of reflect about, you know, why was my new reaction was to I'll be startled? Why, why did I take my avatar to the other side? Which was, was really around, am I invading someone's private uh, space, right? 
So to think about what are the practices and the real life experience that we're bringing into the virtual world. And that's going to be an interested to see in the next coming years. Mm, I agree. Thank you. Mitra, do you want to go? Yes. Hello, everyone. And um, it's so wonderful to be here. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, I'm the technology impact leader at PwCA. And my team and I use technology to address some of our more pressing societal and environmental challenges. I'm also the co-chair of our Women in Tech Network, which focuses on creating an equitable work workplace for our technologists at PwC. Both of these roles have inspired me to be hyper vigilant about the impact of technology, both the good and the bad, as well as the intended and unintended consequences of technology in the workplace and, um, and, and in our communities. That's, um, that's why I'm particularly interested in the dialogue about the future of work um, using um, new technologies and excited to, to learn from our panel today. And I was um, amazed at Courtney's experience as an avatar. My first experience uh, with the virtual work predates probably many of, uh, many of our, our audience members. It was back in the turn of the century. I made my first avatar for um, a gaming um, application. I made my avatar look just like me and um, engaged with others as an avatar. It had that sense of empowerment, which was new and, uh, and refreshing. What's interesting is that of the people who knew me as a person and even my avatar today and talking to um, Craig earlier, um, most people who knew me agreed that the avatar looked just like me. And others uh, who also knew me, but you know maybe differently, uh, thought the opposite. They, they thought it didn't look anything like me. And it made me think about how we see ourselves maybe different from how we are seen by others and, mm. and in the metaverse gives you a certain level of control about equalizing how you see yourself and how others see you um so I, I think that's a really exciting and interesting space to explore i'm still getting used to uh verbella and the and as you remember the first time we met i was still eager to run up to the stage and explore the perspective of the auditorium from stage that i sprinted right past the backdrop behind backstage into a purgatory where no one could find me. And, you know, eventually, and, and not that, you know, it was quite quick. I did manage to jump back into the space with everyone else, but it is a little intimidating getting lost in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. Well, the good news is we had a lot of guides and to work together to, to help us. It's, uh, new for all of us in many ways. And then again, it's really not new at all. It's been around uh, for, for decades here. So I, we are going to talk about that representation of self here in a little bit. I'm really excited to continue that and those thoughts you expressed there. Uh, but first, I want to touch on a Harvard Business School survey found that 81% of employees that have been working from home through the pandemic either don't want to go back to the office or they prefer a hybrid schedule. And a quantum workspace survey resulted in 89% wanting to work hybridly or remotely. So it looks like working remotely is here to stay, at least for companies that want to attract top talent. We miss our colleagues, but we really wanted the flexibility and the work-life balance, remote life affords us. So as we think about flexibility and this new business as usual, how do you think that, that affects gender roles in the workplace? How might women especially benefit when they can work virtually with this flexibility? I can start with if you want to. If you want to. Yeah. So I, I look at the pandemic, Sarah, as the greatest work from home experiment. Seriously, <laughs> you think about it, right? It's just like everyone work from home. And according to Forbes, women rated that experiment much more favorably than men. question is why and, and the point around flexibility i think it provided women the flexibility to have and to benefit from more gender balanced career path and potentially in the future hopefully would reduce the earning and earning inequality 
So having a work-life balance was always a challenge for women. Now that I can work from home, now that I have more control on my hours as a woman, I can tell you I can I can accomplish more and I can go to work with less guilt or less things that occupy me. I don't have to commute. So not only mm -hmm. is good for the environment and sustainability, but also I get more hours in a day where I can either do something else that I need to do and uh, take more, if I choose to, demanding role in, in the workspace. I think these are all flexibilities that women now will have, you know, than previous. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting um, to think about today and historically, women have not had equal access to promotions, to working on mm -hmm. projects, working on high profile accounts or other you know similar privileges which come with uh recognition and reward and beyond giving us back those precious hours of commuting or getting ready for work or you know for me right now um i know the panel knows this but the audience doesn't i'm actually on vacation and i was able to come and you know spend a few hours here i didn't want to miss this I didn't have to actually miss my vacation either. So I'm really happy to have that flexibility. But beyond having that flexibility, virtual workplaces have the potential to offer us more access simply by having more visibility into what's happening in the organization, what else is happening in the organization, making new connections, having more opportunities to showcase our work and our, our, our value. So the work, the virtual work have the potential to do that if we design it to do that. That's why it's really mm -hmm. important to be intentional about living diversity, inclusion, and equity into these virtual models. If we mimic the implicit hierarchies and the unspoken rules of our current workplaces, we just perpetuate status quo with you know more flexible hours. But we have an incredible opportunity to rebuild the workplace to be the equitable environment it can be with, with equal access to success for everyone, regardless of their gender, or ethnicity, or race, or, or other attributes that are not that are not proxies for merit. I think that's a great point. And just Courtney, I'm gonna jump in for a second. I mean, very well put. I've I've got an example here that I think also brings this to life. Um, we acquired um, Success Enterprises, which is a magazine and courses and it's personal development. Um, it's a really compelling business model that fits well with the company. And, you know, it's a 125 year old brand. Wow. Right. And it's always been mm -hmm. a company person based out of Dallas. Um, it was like unleashing the best, I don't want to call it a weapon, but to some degree competitive weapon there is. When I found out that you know, we're obviously going to be able to bring them into this platform and have our own success world I and mean, work that way, it enabled us to pick the best and the brightest talent. We had somebody who was in an editor type role. We were able to promote her to editor in chief of the, of the magazine and enterprises. And what was powerful is she was considered a digital nomad. Now, great, I didn't know what that was, right? Um, it sounded really cool. Mm -hmm. but this is somebody who has traveled in a different country every other quarter. She spent the fourth quarter in Croatia. Her name is Cece Milis, and, and she she just blew it away. She crushed every single performance metric she possibly could. She's, I think, a really shining example of how people can come to the forefront and be wildly successful because they have the opportunity to work whenever and however they want. Just like we're here now, you know, you mentioned people on vacation. I'm actually in a hotel room. Um, if this was in person, I'm not sure if I would have been able to have the bandwidth and I would have missed a really cool opportunity to hang out with everybody today, right? So mm -hmm. I just feel it's massively empowering for an entire workforce and it gives opportunity where there may not have been opportunity before for different types of living arrangements. Absolutely. I love it. I love the inclusion that has been afforded women through the, the experiment <laughs> that is the pandemic as I mentioned. Uh, and I completely agree with Mitra and Courtney and others about the diversity and equity and don't bring in what is broken in the real world, but not bring in, break the bias, uh, hashtag break the bias for International Women's Day, 
and uh, not we have the opportunity to pave a better way forward. So as we mentioned, uh, almost a third of employees feel more productive and focused working from home and employee engagement and recognition are shifting downward. So at the peak of the pandemic, 81% of employees said they know they would be recognized if they contributed to the organization's success. However, this sentiment dropped to 72% by May of 2021, according to that same quantum workplace study. And employees don't feel cared for for engagement decline, even when their productivity goes up. So why do you think employees might be feeling less engaged? And how does your virtual work strategy address these gaps to ensure all employees feel bad by your organization? I'm happy to jump in again. I, you know, it, it, it is funny. You know, you know what you mentioned is we need to start using those stats, right? So I mean, yeah. Um, over the last couple of days, I, I wanted to stress test them, right? And so I, I, I talked to the folks that are in our, our HR function who are wonderful people and are always looking the best and way of clean benefits and opportunities for employees. And I asked you know, it's, it's around 13 to 18%, and that's just kind of like, mainstay it can be a lot higher than that the turnover rate for basically employee departures you know is 3.24 percent for our company which is which is massive right and i and i, I want to know why i want to kind of unpack that right and we also have twice the number of women employed at this company than we do men and these are stats that i mean i pulled them like last 24 hours with the help of hr because i'm trying to kind of scratch my head and go am i seeing the metrics that match up to the way i feel inside right i'm a focus group of one but we've done a number of studies and what we're finding is that employees are obviously you know talk to your first point sarah there's a burnout rate right there's a, a lot of of work that's being done yeah. a lot of people are feeling in high stress situations i mean frankly I, I tested positive for COVID on monday right i was at the very end of it i mean be on a panel with COVID, oh, that's pretty yeah. impressive. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just saying it allows you to do more. But there's a there's a side of that which means you can burn out. Yeah. And I think you know part of this, and I don't have a full solution here. It's just my thoughts for today. Something to kind of you know chew on, is that this environment, when used, you know, for the benefit of employees, gives them that flexible arrangement. And I think it does start to offset some of the burnout. But there's always a flip side, which is you can then work more, right? Like yeah. should people where they everywhere they can. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Where are the boundaries? I mean, I think it's an important dialogue to have. You know, yeah. for employees, just like everyone else who may not even be working, we're all exhausted. You know, we're exhausted from the stress of the pandemic. We have video conference fatigue from having to make eye contact with lots of faces on the screen for back to back hours. We're exhausted from trying to manage our household while we work at the same time. Employees yeah. are having a difficult time engaging with their work, which, by the way, in the bigger picture of what's happening in the world, has become less important. So, how can we not re engage our employees, but supercharge them to become even more productive? And I've been thinking about this too for, for some time. It, I think it really boils down to a sense of belonging, a sense of inclusion. Mm -hmm. And equity with a connection to a common purpose. And I am hopeful that the metaverse can bring people together around similar interests, similar goals, mentorship circles that transcend mentoring people who look and sound just like the mentor, expanding our networks beyond our traditional physical boundaries, engaging on a level that's less bound to our expected communities. I, I, I think that's what I look mm. in the enterprise version of the metaverse is giving people the opportunity to, you know, you said something about the digital nomad before, like to become, you know, someone who is able to, you know, meet people that they would never even think of meeting, right? To be able right. to connect with people that they would be, like they wouldn't even know they exist, but now they're, they're you know, the physical boundaries have have been eroded and, and now we have a chance to feel connected and find people of like mind, but maybe from different places in the world. Mm. That's my yes. yeah, great point. And, and I'll add to that, that I think what we're missing in a lot of time is that interaction Right, that feeling of, of disconnected from peers and leadership 
not being in, in a either a physical or a virtual workplace where we can all do like a whiteboard session. What you could think about what at least in, in my um experience when when we got few people to get medical where we brainstorming and the unit of ideas coming together and that that drives an energy of collaboration. I think people are missing by by um, by fact and, and it's hard. Now top of that to the point where you kind of saying how the biggest challenge is how do you achieve that sense of belonging that drives people and motivates them but at the same time make sure that individuals have their own time and then prioritize um, their life balance uh, at the same time. So, so I think that would be our challenge in the new world. Um, and, and how do we can use the virtual world to build that sense of belonging, that sense of community? And, and I think it narrows down at the end of the day into communication, right? How can we communicate the values of the mm -hmm. values of the company, rally people with you in, in, a, in a way that's both interactive, engaging, and clear. And I, and I hope that that would be one of the things that the, the metaverse of the virtual workplaces would allow us to do, really engage more people to come together, even if it's not physical, but come together to a room, create that um, exchange of thoughts that in my mind, that would be a big um, achievement and, and getting the engagement back. You know, um, Lilac, I think it's such an important it's such an important point to say that, that you bring up about bringing people with different, you know, from different backgrounds and, and different places of thought mm -hmm. together in a, a space that allows each of them to bring what what they have to the table to create a much more um, much more enriched environment for everybody. And, mm -hmm. and I think that if we work together, and the, this is a, a real possibility. I mean, we, we really have the potential to make this uh, something that we all want, which is to be um, seen and heard equally. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, and, and to add to that real quick, you just, you made me think of something. It's bringing together the people with a variety of thoughts from places that maybe I wouldn't have hired before, right? So mm -hmm. the ability to count the talent that I yes. wouldn't have had access to, that's what made the diversity, that what can kind of get us into that uh, better collaboration and potentially results. I think it's going to be great, great tools for the future. And so, so a tip on breaking down of boundaries, both geographically and just in terms of, of that connection. Uh, it is really important uh, and underlying that feeling of belonging, that feeling of inclusion as we're talking about. There's an interesting ADP Research uh, Institute study that actually came up with metrics that can measure people's feeling a connection. I'm a big, big fan of data, and I think Courtney and others mentioned that, that they found that it broke down into three areas, as you just mentioned, is feeling seen, feeling heard, and feeling valued. And they found that those that felt connected to their employer are 75 times more likely to be engaged than those than those who don't feel connected. And those experiencing discrimination, which you know, I've seen some of that mentioned in the chat, are five times less likely to be strongly connected and twice as much to be not connected at all. So clearly, connection is important for employee engagement. So let's start with the seen and heard components of that. So with, with these amazing customizable avatars, uh, and even more options coming our way. And Rabella, as we heard earlier to, in the keynote, communication features like spatial voice and text and also nonverbal communication like waving or talking. We have so many controls and options now for how we choose to represent ourselves to others. And so how do you think that choice of representation matters when it comes to feeling seen and heard as an avatar? And do you think that choice and benefit employees and how to create and cultivate a diverse workforce where everyone feels included. I, I can take this um, first. There's much debate about should 
all avatars look the same, so we don't use visible attributes to discriminate, or do we go hyper detailed with expressions of representation and individuality? Mm -hmm. And then for me, and I hope for others too, it's not about being equal, it's about equity. Mm -hmm. Today, like we said, you know, we have unspoken rules and opaque hierarchies that frankly promote exclusion, a total lack of diversity, and, and as a result, it, it creates a lot of inequity. Uh, to, to achieve equity, we need social rules and governance of the virtual port workplace to be transparent. I've been fascinated by the entire gaming industry. The rules are the rules. When you're in a game, you're, the rules are the rules. There's no nepotism. Mm -hmm. There's no secret handshake. We know what needs to happen to win a game or to score more points. That's not the same in the workplace. We all know that. We built the same protocol that keep, you know, that keep groups of us from being seen and heard back into the virtual world. Then we've missed the opportunity, much like we did with the first version of the web. So I think it's really important yes. to make sure that we have diversity in the creating community, in the building community of these virtual workplaces, and that we have really thoughtful governance and, you know, sort of ethics that don't inhibit us, that don't provide, you know, don't impose boundaries, but that they enable us to have a very different experience that doesn't replicate what we have in the physical world. I think a, a great example, yes. such an inspiring way of putting it. Um, you think about unconscious bias, right? Mm -hmm. One of them is ageism. I don't know about you guys, but I don't yeah. know if anyone is right now that I'm, that I'm talking to. I have no idea. And it, and it <laughs> plays through on the entire team, right? So I think you look at, there's so many examples of this unconscious bias, right? There's weight, there's affinity, yeah. there's beauty, there's gender, there's ageism, there's conformity. Like so many, I call, I almost called it unintentional, but it's really unconscious. I'm not even conscious of some of these things. When you remove that imagery and that distraction, I think you hear, as we mentioned before, ideas come into the forefront where maybe they wouldn't be heard before. It, quite, it creates this kind of, this, this equal mm -hmm. you know, to some degree, the best that we can. And I just read Heather's comment. Yeah, feel more confident being behind my avatar. I think Maya, Maya and Marco, big, you know, you know, hand clap here, hands in for, for the wonderful marketing team at Verbella. I pinged them a couple hours ago. Um, are we doing video at all? Because there's a video feature. And they're like, no. I'm like, yes. But one less thing I have to worry about. Sarah jumps in the air too, right? <laughs> I think we're all kind of getting ready, right? No bad hair <laughs> so that That's my point of view here is if mm -hmm. there's a TV noise out there that this can remove. <laughs> And for the, for the record, um, I know you haven't met me, but I'm 21. Um, Ooh, and, huh? after that. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and, but over the period, you know, uh, want us to look at, at numbers and facts and see how bad it is in the world. Where, you know, in, in the biggest tech companies, women are oh, the best of the world. And that's a problem. And, and we know that. Um, Gender roles have been decided by social and cultural facts, not by biological factors whatsoever. We're sitting here at right. the interest point trying to define equality, and we have a way mm -hmm. to shape it from scratch, from scratch, not taking the bias that we, mm -hmm. we came from and, and build it from. Um, Designing it with the right thoughts in mind, empowering uh, those individuals without distinctions of, of gender discrimination, without age discrimination, and everything else. So I cannot, you know, agree more with the team. Like, let's take uh, and, and take what we know and any bias that we know, scratch it out, bring women to the front, uh, to the front to help us design the new workspace of the future from physical to culture to roles, and that I would think would be um, the, the opportunity of how we need to go in, in the new world. You know, Courtney brings, uh, you know, by like, thank yes. you for- Flip, I got it, Flip, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> how 
why you did. I, I, I thought amazingly well put. Really, really awesome. I, I wanted to just kind of double down on what um, Courtney started talking about the unconscious or unintended or unexamined biases that we have. We all have that because we've all been raised in a world that's full of them. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we can't, you know, we can be anti sexist and anti racist, but we all have those biases built into the way we were raised and the way society reinforces that. So to be the architects of a new world where those made discriminations or biases or um, perspectives of, of people based on um, attributes that are not, again, proxies for um, merit or how we use them, it's a really important responsibility that we all need to show up for. And when I say we yes. all need to show up for, we can't just say, I'm, you know, well, we're, I'm going to leave it to so and so who is, you know, in the, uh, you know, creative UX. I'm, I'm not going to leave it up to legal. I'm not going to, I'm going to show up every day to make sure that the environment that we're building for our future is equitable. And we each have a responsibility and we mm -hmm. each have something. Um, even, even by deciding not to be a bystander, we have made a decision to participate in the future that we're building. Right. Mm -hmm. I love it. I think the power of that statement, and we are, we do have this inflection point. We have this opportunity to to rebuild better, and we need to be a part of it for sure. Thank you, um, Trump. Hey, Trevor, I'm going to take your, I'm going to steal your, your sentence. <coughs> Architects of the new world. <coughs> I did too. So this is really fascinating. I think this conversation about representation and uh, Nicole shared with us earlier when highlighting the amazing new avatar system that's coming in and then follow your you know, look, feel and be yourself. This is the thing we've been talking about here. How important is the accuracy and the authenticity, not necessarily to exclusive for our digital selves? Are avatars that mirror our actual appearance accurate as possible? The ultimate goal, I think Mitra touched on this early on, the literal digital twin. I know my husband uh, wishes sometimes that there's more detail in the bases because he has a hard time differentiating between avatars sometimes. Or, does having the choice to vary from an exact copy allow some people to feel more authentic in their digital selves? Meaning, can she skin color and uh, what they have in life allow some to align their true identity? What do you think? You know, your identity is how you see yourself. Mm -hmm. And and as I said, you know, in my, you know, when I introduced myself and you asked the question about, you know, your interaction with in the virtual world and as an avatar, you know, I see myself the way that I made my avatar look. And mm -hmm. it may not be exactly the way you see me if you met me in, in the physical world, but it's how I see myself. And, you know, when I saw Craig in the green room earlier, he said, you look exactly like the last time I saw you five years ago. And I said, yes, it's my age. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so I, you know, I chose to, you know, look like that. Now, if I had, um, you know, other functionality that, you know, enabled me to make myself, you know, have other attributes, I may have chosen them as well. But this is how I see myself. This is how I want you to see me. And I want, I don't want you to focus too much on a lot of different, this is how I see it, right? This is, I don't want you to focus on too many physical um, attributes. I want you to focus on hearing me and seeing the value that I can potentially bring and not get distracted by falling mm -hmm. into the, you know, the, the, the consumer trap of, of you know trying to look a certain way 
conformity, all of that. So I have yeah. that, that's my personal point of view. And again, as I said earlier, I don't think that all avatars should look the same. Just we have an opportunity in mm -hmm. the virtual world to control how people see us the way we want to be seen. Mm -hmm. That power of choice. And I'm curious to if that hopefully confidence that, that comes from representing oneself as one chooses and, and feels most authentic, does that allow people, and especially women or, or others that might be in a minority, to speak up louder and more often and in situations where they might not? Or, or do you think about the, the confidence enabling factor of being able to represent oneself in the choice that comes with that, even if it might vary from your real life? I do get comments on my gray hair a lot, by the way, just for the ageism thing. I, do, I think it's so interesting when people see me in real life and, and they wonder why I, I chose that. It's how I, I might not all be gray, yet, but it's how I, I see that. Someone mentioned wheelchairs earlier as well, and if it's a rock when we can't in real life, those types of things. Well, I just, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say, don't you think that it's an empowering um, way of when you mm. can control what you want others to be you as, whatever your choice may be, that you have that choice. The choice is, is yours. It wasn't something, a card that you were dealt, right? Mm -hmm. And to add to, to your point, ladies, I think we only bring the best of us when we bring the authentic in us and, mm. and shine. And, and yes. how do you bring the authentic you to the table? You bring your voice, you bring your opinion, you bring your passion to the table. I think those are all can be, and your opinion, of course, so, so if, I, if I omitted that, but, but those are all can be expressed easily without the accuracy of an avatar, right? And, and mm. uh, earlier, Courtney and, and Lisa both talk about the bias and how we can remove the bias. So if I don't portray or it, it, if my avatar is not accurate to how it looks, does it matter? I don't think it does. On the contrary, I think it gives you the maybe the boost and the confidence to bring more of the authentic you to the table versus the, the external part of you. Exactly, I'm of the same mind as you. Mm. And I think that's so, the win, right? I mean, yeah. when you take away all of these things and you control for them, substance ends up winning over what would be um, aesthetics, which is important. And it, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because when I think about, you know, the last two years of working in world and seeing the avatars, you know, you know, there's a lot of, um, progression in terms of look and feel and, and how this is all coming together and, and the next wave and the next world. Um, at the same time, you know, I see the people I've worked for with for the last two years and, and when someone changes their avatar, I mean, I think we were in the green room earlier, we were discussing, should we have matching jackets or not, right? Like, these are like seriously deep thoughts, <laughs> but a conversation you would not organically have, right? And if somebody decides to change their appearance, Normally, how that's greeted, at least in the last two years of my experience, is you're like, oh, did you get a haircut? Or, oh, I like your new shirt, or our CFA <laughs> has a lucky So it becomes part of the, I think it's very cultural, mm -hmm. right? I, I do think, though, if somebody comes in, like, let's say I've looked the same the last two years, and I look dramatically different from an avatar perspective, mm -hmm. people that have context and know me, they're probably going to ask, mm -hmm. just like if I showed up in real life looking a little different. So I think it really comes back to the norm of the environment you're in. Yeah, I completely agree. So we're on a wrap up uh, with kind of this, this feeling of being valued as part of the connection. So we've, we've talked about seeing her and <laughs> such a fascinating discussion. I think it could go uh, on and on about, especially with all the choices we had coming here. Um, and then I'm going to call on Misha. It's, it's, it's this PWC poll survey that um, was done a business executive Joe that nearly a third so the investing in de &I initiatives and improving reporting on those initiatives top priorities in 2022. And more than three quarters are planning to keep hybrid work functional reality. 
Walking 77% to the hiring and retaining talent is most critical to achieving growth in 2022. So how does your talent recruitment and retainment strategy for 2022 focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion? And how does your hybrid and remote work policy factor into your approach? And while again, Gordon, I'll be asking you all the same questions as we go. So be ready. Micha, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay, so our um, DNI uh, strategy, particularly the one that I'm executing on for the technologists at PwC, hasn't really changed um, in terms of uh, you know sort of post-pandemic, pre-pandemic. We still focus on three highly valued areas of recruiting, uh, retention, and rewarding. And we do that through a, a dozen programs that you know include um, you know our employees mentoring each other and coaching each other, engaging executives in advocacy for promoting our highest performers regardless of their background, and um, enabling lifelong learning for for everyone through upskilling and training. And and in particular for recruiting, we're expanding our our sources. We're not fishing from the same pond. We're, we've developed a, a digital upskilling curriculum, a, a, a 30 hour virtual um, upskilling program as part of our larger effort around uh, leadership development and, and mentorship, and offering it to students at um, historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutes and community colleges. It's, it's our intention to hire uh, 10,000 of, of the um, Black and Latino graduates of this program in the next few years. This is how we are pivoting the way the way we go to um, our people, way we engage in and create that sense of being seen and heard and valued at the at the organization. Starting at the recruiting, we even actually start sooner in the pipeline working you know, in high schools and elementary schools and colleges, and then engaging our people in the, in the mentorship, in the coaching of, of the recruits, of their peers, and even reverse coaching to the executives um, in terms of you know, digital skills, et cetera. So I think it's, um, it's mm. really important to recognize that um, Diversity actually leads to more innovative, more productive outcomes. And inclusion yes, yes. Um, ends up making everyone feel like they belong. And equity, treating everyone with dignity and um, equal pay keeps people, keeps people loyal. And recognizing them and rewarding them for what they have done Will, will make us all um, strive towards that same goal of, of equity in the workplace. I think it's really important for us to recognize that this is not just uh, check the box. This is not just lip service. This is actually an important, significant, crit critical, critical success factor for future of work. Okay. Wonderful. Now, Lila and Courtney, I want to give you the opportunity to share your strategies as well, but I wanted to make sure that um, we have for the audience. So um, I'm just going to put a question out there that you can work into it uh, if you share with us. Lila, I'll have you go next. Um, but the audience is really wanting to know how much more comfortable and safe you feel in this environment than on video conferencing or in person. And um, you are kind of talking about it before. I refer to myself as an uh, introvert in real life and an extrovert in virtual life. I know it has transformed some confidence and things for me. So kind of in terms of safety and, and confidence and anxiety is the question coming from the audience, as well as touching on anything that at t is doing around DE&I um, and initiatives. Maya? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll I'll start first from from the question from the audience because I think it's it's a critical one. Um, I 
personally feel much more safe in the virtual world <clears throat> versus on the video side to your point it allows me to become you know, much more uh, vocalist and, and as i mentioned before bring the authentic me into the conversation rather focus on okay do i need to do a book code or do i need to wear a certain hmm. thing i think that the virtual world really allows and and, and and the individual without any distinction and this talented individual who maybe otherwise may be being uh in in kind of in, in the normal situation in a normal uh, work environment but now can feel more safe uh, to share their views and, and be more vocal at, at the table i think this is where the virtual world has a definite uh, um, benefit compared to the real world environment you you talked about uh, earlier about uh diversity and inclusion and and i have to say at t has a historic uh value and and around the playing a key role in in uh, diversity and inclusion uh, i wouldn't say for, from our from our perspective we invest millions and millions of dollars in, in last year and 200 million dollars a month in diversity and inclusion initiative um and, and building the right talent now i'm going to talk about the future of recruiting which i think this is where we need to start pointing and looking at, and especially when it comes to women. If, if you look at the at the um, the way we recruit today, right, the, the normal process, it's um, a recruiter that that sends the network to go find the talent. You've got the talent on the other hand applies and send their resume very dry, a system that match on keywords, but. I want us to start thinking about the future of recruitment mm -hmm. and how we can easily jump on a on an on a virtual environment with both of us kind of handshake and where you can bring again, I keep saying it, your authentic self without any bias to the table to talk to a recruiter. So think about that. I want to also talk about the role of virtual world mm -hmm. in in allowing women and and kind of uh, setting up the same ground, the same level here for women and men in a role would would maybe now incorporate more stimulation versus hey, I, I you know uh, men versus women in a role, and if, if you incorporate simulation and everyone pass the same simulation and you get the results. And it's an objective way to now start recruiting and identify talent in the new corporate world. These are the future that I think at and is also looking mm -hmm. to bring together with the power that, that we can do in our of our network and the power of 5G that would allow us to uh, build us ecosystems and, and uh, bring those tools to life. So I'm very excited about that topic, as you can see. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. And it's it just a do need to think about how do we update and involve these processes um, thinking about recruitment and, and young people and our expectations and our expectations as a society and what does a virtual society look like as we've touched on throughout. Now, Courtney, I know you touched earlier on, on recruitment and then also uh, touching back on the audience question around the feelings of, of safety or dealing with anxiety um, as well. So. What do you think? You know, to, to that question of, do I feel more comfortable? Mm. I feel safe. I mean, I literally feel safer knowing, you know, that I, like I said, had mentioned, I, you know, last week had COVID and was still recovering. The fact that I can't get anybody sick right now, and I'm talking to you all, <laughs> for me is a huge win, right? And I, I've, I've yeah. seen most of the people on my team and, and allowing people when they feel up to it to participate is huge because I know mm -hmm. how, how, Pressing, frankly, it can be when you don't feel well, right? And how people are dealing with all kinds, of, whether it be mental or physical um, wellness, that is challenging more more now than ever before. And so I think one, we have to be really kind to each other, right? I mean, that's just kind of like the overall rule. Yeah. But in terms of comfortable, I, I'd say it's comfort, but it, it moves in, even to the safety side for me. I feel like I can talk to my team um, when they're ready. I can be accessible, 
And, you know, starting a team, you know, we built out the, the marketing function significantly over the last two to three years, like many functions in this company. And I, you know, I had a question like, what do I feel is close to this team, right? Uh, um, when I hadn't met many of them, hadn't seen them. The answer is, I feel more close. It, you end up pulling on different yeah. um, strengths, flexing different muscles, right? That you, you end up listening more because you're, you're hearing people and you're not distracted by other things. So, you know, for me, it's been fundamentally life-changing in terms of how I build teams. We've reinvigorated, like I mentioned, functions, infused new talent. Um, what's profound is the fact that we've lifted boundaries and borders for growth and development. If you had said to me that I could literally work anywhere in the world I want right now, I, I would have been blown away and be this productive and being able to give that to other people and let them live their lives to their fullest is a gift that I think we're getting to give people with technology. Mm. That's so amazing. And and to your point about being able to show up and not get your colleagues sick or whatever it is, I know that that's a big reason why a lot of people come to work when they're sick because they don't want to be left out of the conversation. They want to be at the table and with in particular, so I think as we talked about that, that being able to show up, being able to feel confident in one authentic self, being able to recruit a more diverse workforce, as you mentioned, it really strengthens a company from that diversity. All such amazing. And, and I am so glad that uh, th these three amazing men, thank you so much, Mitra and Lila and Courtney for being here and sharing your wisdom with us today. I think uh, it gives me confidence that I have a pretty darn good start to building this and doing this the right way. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for having us. Yeah. I am uh, just incredibly moved from you know this this yeah, session. I, I thank you so much to to all of you for for sharing your stories and. Some of them very personal stories um and and i think you know the the power of being able to share these those stories to an audience this big and uh and it just really demonstrates what you know the connection that we can make in this type of environment um and uh really moving emotionally to to hear these stories and and, and connect with you all and thanks so much for the honor of, of, of hearing you here and, and sharing with us uh, thank you as well to Sarah for, for just being a fantastic for Bella community leader and, and for really raising the, the topics that are so important to, to women everywhere. Um, wow, so what, what a fantastic conversation. Thank you again. Um, we have a lot more in store and more stories to be shared. And, and I think it's, it, you know, sometimes I've got to pinch myself because like almost every event that we have is is groundbreaking in, in a sort of way. Like we're literally teaching each other and, and teaching our clients and link from our clients and our partners, like how to create this better world and this better place to work and connect as we go. So really just to hear the the new comments and some new stories and, and, and the experiences, I mean, it's just, it's just mind blowing. And, and I really uh, appreciate um, the, uh, the ability to learn from those around us. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you.